and welcome to Arirang News. It's Tuesday, September 30th here in Korea, live from Seoul. I'm Na Hyun Gyeong. The stories we are following at this hour. Korea's main rival parties struggled to get the paralyzed parliament going by holding back-to-back three-way meetings with the bereaved families of April's ferry disaster. One of China's biggest smartphone makers, Huawei, makes inroads into the lucrative Korean market. A low-cost X3 model is out in the market starting today. And with Japan's Mount Ontake suddenly erupting over the weekend and killing some 30 people, concerns rise about the possibility of Mount Fuji being next. And now we begin again at the National Assembly where a political impasse persists due to a special bill that will decide the makeup of an investigation committee on April's ferry disaster. A plenary session was originally scheduled to open just about now. Let's connect to our Chim Young Gil standing by at the National Assembly. So Myung Gil, what's the situation there now? Hello, Hyung Gyeong. The plenary session was scheduled to start just a few minutes ago. But it looks like it will be postponed as the full leader of the ruling family party, Lee Wang Gu, and the full leader of the main opposition, New Politics Alliance for Democracy, Park Yong Sun, are still holding talks behind closed doors. There is some speculation that today's plenary session might even be cancelled. If, if it does take place, opposition party lawmakers may choose to continue their boycott of parliamentary affairs. With or without them, the ruling party has said they will go ahead a vote on 90 draft bills that have been gathering dust for months. And even if the two floor leaders make a compromise on how to settle the Seoul Ferry bill, the main opposition party will still have to open a caucus with its party lawmakers to decide on whether to attend today's plenary session. Hmm. So it seems like uh, many uncertainties still linger. There was a t- trilateral meeting this morning between the rival parties and the families of ferry disaster victim. Anything worth mentioning from those talks? Yes, the floor leaders of the rival parties and representatives of victims' families met to discuss the special Seoul Ferry Bill. The family representative refused to elaborate on the specifics of what they requested during those talks. But it is believed they gave main opposition party full leader Park Yong san the authority to negotiate with the ruling party over the newly revised bill. Their request, from what we're hearing, is that when a state prosecutor is picked to head the fact finding committee in charge of investigating the ferry disaster, the bereaved families want a say in who that person will be. Originally, the families had asked that the fact finding committee be given prosecutorial powers. But it seems they've now backed from that request. Now, even if opposition parties agree, it remains to be seen whether the ruling party will. Hmm. So there are lots of ifs and even ifs uh, concerning the matter. So what are the prospects for the session being opened today? Any signs that it will? Well, Chang Gyeong, no signs yet. But remember that Assembly Speaker Chang Yiwa, as he postponed the plenary session last week, He said he would open today's plenary session no matter what. He said the opposition party wanted to take the weekend to gather opinions from party members and straighten out their stance. Also, remember that not a single bill has been passed by the Assembly over the past 150 days. On top of the dozens of bills that remain pending, the rival parties have a number of other issues to iron out, including the dates for annual parliamentary audits of the government, passing next year's budget bill and reviewing thousands of other bills. I'll be back throughout the day with updates. This is Myung reporting live from the National Assembly. All right, Myung Gil, thank you very much. That was our National Assembly correspondent, Chim Myung Gil, reporting live for us. Now, while lawmakers were wrangling over the so called special ferry bill, there were fresh concerns about another accident. A ferry ran aground in waters off Korea's southwestern island earlier this Tuesday morning, but all 109 people aboard the ship were reportedly rescued safely. The Vacant Ho ferry was carrying 104 passengers and five crew members when it struck a rock in waters near Hongdo Island in Jeollanam-do province at around that was at around 9 a.m. Now the Coast Guard said everyone was evacuated from the ferry in 20 minutes and that they were taken to a nearby port on the island. 
In other news, the United States has declined to comment on rumors of a military coup in North Korea. Speaking to reporters following Monday's press briefing, State Department spokesperson Jen Psaki said she has seen the reports but could neither confirm nor deny them. It's been nearly a month since North Korean leader Kim Jong-un was seen in public spurring wild rumors about his whereabouts. Now, one of those rumors is that Kim has been arrested following a coup. Another is that the young leader has been hospitalized after undergoing surgery on his leg. Recent video footage released by the North showed the young leader walking with a limp. And a new report shows that political instability in North Korea worsened in the year 2013. The World Bank's latest edition of its worldwide governance indicators says North Korea is among the nations in worst shape when it comes to political stability and absence of violence. The index saw a significant drop for the first time since 2010. Watchers say political variables such as the execution of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's uncle Chang Song Tech contributed to the drop. Addressing the many human rights issues in Asia, including Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of women, Korea's top judge has stressed the need to set up a human rights court in Asia. Chief Justice Park Han Chul explained his vision to hundreds of judges from around the world that have gathered in Seoul. Kim Min Ji has the details. Around 350 people from some 100 countries have gathered in Seoul to attend the Congress of the World Conference on Constitutional Justice. Hosted by the Constitutional Court of Korea, the event is being held under the theme Constitutional Justice and Social Integration. We need to pursue international standards and ensure universal human rights. We also need to think about the effects that a ruling may have on international relations. In a keynote address, Chief Justice Park kan proposed the establishment of a special court in Asia that would deal with human rights issues. Indirectly referring to Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of women, he stressed the need for a regional court, saying that Asia had bore witness to human rights violation during times of war and that their sufferings continue to this day. Park noted the European Court of Human Rights as a potential model. He said the court brought integration and regional peace to the European Union. The court, which is comprised of 47 member states, was set up in 1959 by the European Convention on Human Rights. Pak said when the Asian court is set up, it will bring about regional integration and give people more dignity. The four-day conference will end on Wednesday with participants adopting a sole communique on the issues they discussed. Kim min Arirang News. The Korean smartphone market is known to be a hard nut to crack, mostly because of Samsung's presence and its unique mobile telecommunications structure. But those factors are apparently not stopping foreign manufacturers, including China's Huawei, from trying. Our Hwang Ji-hae has more. Those in Korea trying to buy a new smartphone now have one more option. That is the X3 model from Chinese budget smartphone manufacturer Huawei Technologies, which hit local shelves on Tuesday. Huawei expects to lure Korean consumers with its affordably priced handsets, which are up to $400 cheaper than local brands like Samsung Electronics. Korea's smartphone market is considered difficult to break into, with most citizens loyal to Samsung and its domestic rival. Currently, the Korean tech giant controls around 60 percent of the local market, followed by LG Electronics. Apple, one of the world's most popular smartphone makers, holds below 10 percent of the local share. It's no surprise, then, that U.S.-based Motorola gave up on the Korean market in 2012, while Taiwan's HTC also folded its Korean business in the same year. But it's not just Huawei that's aiming to take on the Korean smartphone market. Sony of Japan recently unveiled its high-end Xperia Z3 smartphone, which also boasts a cheaper price tag compared to local brands, pointing to even stiffer competition among local and foreign players. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. 
whether it be the government's recent expansionary policies or better economic conditions in advanced countries, business sentiment is improving in the nation. But some say it's still too early to say the economy is back on track toward full recovery. Our Kim ji has this next report. More companies are feeling positive about the Korean economy, largely due to the government's expansionary policies and signs of recovery in the United States. A survey of 600 companies by the Federation of Korean Industries shows that the business survey index for October exceeded the 100 mark for the first time in five months. A figure over 100 means that the optimists outnumber pessimists over economic conditions. The positive sentiment was also shared in the manufacturing Manufacturing sector. The Bank of Korea says its business survey index of manufacturing companies edged up to 74 in September. That's two points higher than the previous month, when the level was its lowest in 13 months. But the country's industrial output was disappointing. In August, it dropped by 0.6 percent from the previous month, switching to negative growth for the first time in three months. Statistics Korea attributes this to the drop in the number of working days due to summer vacations and a growing number of labor strikes in the automobile sector. And adds that it's too early to say that the Korean economy is on the steady path to recovery. The Federation of Korean Industries points to hurdles, namely the strengthening of the Korean won, the weakening Japanese yen, lackluster private consumption and a slump in exports to China. Kim ji Arirang News. The summer of 2014 was one to remember for Korea's tourism sector. New figures from the Bank of Korea and the Korea Culture and Tourism Institute show that tourism revenue hit more than one and a half billion U.S. dollars last month. That's up 50 percent on year and the second highest monthly total ever following only July of this year. The record numbers coincide with a record number of Chinese tourists coming to Korea. Four million Chinese visited the country in the January to August period, up nearly 40 percent compared to the same period last year. Now, in August, Chinese tourists made up more than half of all foreign visitors to Korea. In the year 2012, for Korea was added record high. All of the day's important events, events close to home and around the world. Join Na Hyung Young. Live from Seoul. Cobalt Shopping Market thinks the true meaning of creation shines through. The sudden eruption of Mount Ontake in Japan over the weekend has reminded people that the island nation has more than a hundred live volcanoes. Mount Ontake is getting people worried that the country's biggest mountain, Mount Fuji, may be ready to blow for the first time in hundreds of years. Our Son Jung In has this story. Mount Fuji is the highest point on the Japanese archipelago, rising 700 meters taller than Mount Ontake. Located not far from major cities like Tokyo and Yokohama, the mountain has recently been showing some signs that an eruption may be coming, including sinking roads and receding lake waters in the area. Mount Fuji has discharged lava at least 43 times in the past 2,000 years. It erupts on average every 50 years, but has stayed ominously silent for the last 300. A recent research found that the 9.0 magnitude earthquake in Japan's east in 2011 increased the pressure beneath the volcanic mountain. If Mount Fuji were to erupt, experts warn of extensive damage. It could spell disaster for Shizuoka Prefecture with more than 750,000 residents left homeless. The harmful ash discharge could also damage the health of 12 million people residing in Tokyo and other metropolitan areas within the volcano's reach. Another problem lies in the evacuation system, or lack thereof. According to a government study, 80 percent of areas threatened by the effects of a volcanic eruption have no viable evacuation plan. With thousands of hikers visiting Mount Fuji every day, concerns are rising that Japan should start preparing now before it's too late. Son Jung In, Arirang News. In Hong Kong, thousands of pro democracy activists are not budging, still blocking major parts of the city. They are demanding universal suffrage, and reports coming out of Hong Kong say much of the city will be shut down today as well. Our Connie Kim reports. 
Civil unrest in Hong Kong is continuing as thousands of pro-democracy protesters occupy the city's major streets after defying the authorities' call to go home. Demonstrators covered up in masks, goggles and raincoats in case of another police crackdown similar to the one that occurred on Monday when officers fired pepper spray and tear gas at the protesters. Schools and businesses around the government complex remain closed as thousands block the commercial district of Causeway Bay to Central's East and across the harbor to Kowloon's Mongkok. Over 50 people have been injured since the protests flared up on Saturday. Demonstrators are demanding universal suffrage in Hong Kong's 2017 elections and that Beijing abandon its plan to vet candidates for the post of chief executive. We, we, have, we have a simple message is that uh, we just want a democracy and a fair uh, voting of choosing our chief executive of Hong Kong. Up until now, Beijing had been nominating the chief executive and China was quick to warn other nations against supporting what it calls illegal rallies. We hope that related nations show a considerate stance regarding the protest in Hong Kong and do not send out a wrong message to protesters. However, the U.S. and Britain have both said the demonstrators' rights should be protected and the people of Hong Kong should be granted universal suffrage. Connie Kim, Arirang News. And now on to the Syrian-Turkey border where residents of the Syrian city of Kobani say they are terrified as Islamic State militants continue to make gains toward them. The London-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said the jihadist group was as close as three kilometers away from the mostly Kurdish city. If they are successful, IS would gain a full stretch of land from the Turkish border to the group's declared capital of Raqqa some 100 kilometers away. Eyewitnesses said the U.S.-led coalition airstrikes were too few and too far back from the front lines. Meanwhile, a U.S. think tank released analysis on Monday estimating that American military efforts against IS could cost at least $2.4 billion per year. And moving on, Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates has once again topped Forbes magazine's rich list with an estimated net worth of some 81 billion U.S. dollars. That makes this the 21st consecutive year that he has come in first in the Forbes 400 richest people in America list. Forbes said Gates added $9 billion to his net worth this past year, in part thanks to a rise in value of his Microsoft shares as well as other investments. The American Business Magazine also praised the 58-year-old for his humanitarian work. Earlier this month, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation had pledged $50 million to fight the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, the single largest donation the foundation Foundation has committed to a cause. If you ask foreigners visiting Korea what they find beautiful, one of the things that never fails to be mentioned is Korea's porcelain work. For those interested, there's an exhibition that centers around the prized white and blue porcelain of Korea. And our Im Hyun Hee joins us today for more on that exhibition. Good afternoon, Yoon Hee. Good afternoon. Right, so the National Museum of Korea opened this exhibition today, in fact. And some of Korea's most important white and blue porcelain works are included, along with some of Korea's official uh, national treasure, so take a look. A beautiful blue dragon sprawled across the body of a delicate white porcelain jar. During the Joseon dynasty, porcelain work saw many transformations, including the use of cobalt blue glaze weighed against the pure white, resulting in these blue and white porcelain works, also known as Changwa porcelain. This exhibition features Joseon Dynasty Celadon and porcelain, highlighting its value to Korea's history. Now more can discover the beauty of Korean Cheongwa porcelain. It's a centuries-old technique that was seen across the Asian continent, but Korea developed a style of its own. One of the most valuable works on display is a Cheongwa porcelain lidded jar with a plum and bamboo design. The national treasure shows the Korean artist's unique use of the pure empty space, 
creating more simplistic masterpiece right on the surface of the jar. But what makes these works so valuable is that the cobalt blue had to be imported from Islamic countries, so access to the craft was extremely rare. Only the country's best craftsmen were given the opportunity to use the blue coloring, making it all the more popular with the royalty and the wealthy. During the mid to late 18th century, Changhua porcelain was enjoyed by the aristocrat class, characterized by the simplistic paintings of the four gracious plants, landscapes, animals, and patterns. The era of elegant Changhua porcelain was short lived, as Korea endured the Japanese invasion. But each graceful brushstroke, preserved on these porcelain jars, is a priceless piece of Korea's history. Hmm, so white and blue porcelain works were also being produced mm -hmm. in other countries during that time. Right. So there's something unique about Korea's history of Cheongwa porcelain, mm -hmm. you say. So right, you saw in the report, um, I mentioned that this blue coloring had to be imported from Islamic countries. Um, and at that time, it was hard to get your hands on it. And so uh, this was, you could, it proves that it was used way before the 18th century, uh, which is when it really hit its peak here in Korea. And in fact, this can be traced all the way to the 14th century, where mm. it was first found in China. And and so that stylistic uh, trait of using this blue dye on this um, porcelain work was it made its way around the world. And here in Korea, it really did develop its own unique style, which is very simplistic, uh, very elegant, like you saw in the report, which is what Korea's uh, blue and white porcelain is really known for. And so the artists really use this white as not a canvas, but mm -hmm. as uh, another medium for the work. Mm -hmm. And how many pieces altogether are being uh, presented at the exhibition then? So the museum is showing 500 pieces, which wow. is yeah, right. That's a, very a lot, big, considering uh -huh. that you also mentioned that it's very unique to find these uh, artworks. Right, right. So it is very hard to get your hands on these artworks because they were very rare at that time. Um, so the museum had to borrow these works from museums all over the world, in fact. Some from Korea, from the Iriya Museum, the Hori Museum in Korea, but also from museums in Japan. Um, the Idemitsu Museum in Tokyo um, also gave us some works to show, too. So it's a very country, I mean, a worldwide, you know, collaborative effort to put mm. this exhibition together. Mm -hmm. So Korea's Cheonghwa porcelain mm -hmm. has, uh, it's been praised in other countries as well, it seems like. Right, right. A beautiful, beautiful work. That in this exhibition really does give you a look at the Chosun porcelain culture as a whole. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much, Yuni, for bringing this story to us today. You're very welcome. Good afternoon, I'm Lee Ji Hyun here with your latest weather updates. Now the cloudy and foggy skies from the morning have transitioned into mostly to partly sunny conditions with highs hovering in the low to mid 20s across the nation. So let's take a closer look at today's temperatures. Now the high in Seoul will rise to 24, while Daegu and Gwangju will peak at 23 and 27, and Busan will rise to 24 this afternoon. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like down on Daejeon and Jeju will peak at 24, and Tokdo and Mount Kungang will rise to 17 and 8, respectively. Now, over in Incheon, the host city of Asian Games will enjoy typical autumn weather today as well. So the weather should cooperate for Korea's football match against Thailand, which will be held at 8 p.m. tonight, but if you plan to watch the game at the stadium, be sure to dress warmly. And it seems like the typical fall weather will continue for the remainder of the week under mostly to partly sunny skies before rain returns on Thursday. Also, do notice the chillier morning lows that we are having and dress accordingly to avoid getting sick. Now, that's all I have for you today and hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. All right, that's all we have for you at this hour. Thank you for watching. I'll be back with more updates at 4 p.m. Korea time.